Imagine driving along the highway in the middle of rural Taylor County in the 1960s and seeing this rising from the earth. That was a very real possibility then, as the United States was in full defense mode against those that would seek to do us harm. Today, we're headed to the small town of Lawn, Texas, to learn about the Atlas Missile Silos and explore what's left of one such silo beneath the rugged Texas terrain. Texas is full of lost history. From lost cemeteries to abandoned buildings. From the infamous to the obscure. Hitch a ride and travel across the Lone Star State, looking for hints of Texas' colorful past. Our lost history. This is Expedition Texas, and we're gonna find it. never been to Lawn, Texas before. To find it, you'd most likely have to know someone there. One of those blink and you'd miss it kind of towns. But aren't those the ones we truly wish we could make more time to visit? Still, Lawn sits in relative obscurity and possibly with no one there remembering a time that the little town was just one red button away from the whole world knowing where it was. Because of this place and what lies beneath these innocent looking structures. Meet Larry Sanders, a lifelong fan of military aviation and the owner of the Atlas Missile Site in Lawn, Texas. Well, when I first came to Abilene Christian College, I became aware that Abilene, Texas had hosted the Atlas ICBM mission. In 1971, as a freshman, I didn't have any of the resources for investigation like I do today via the internet. So it was literally years before I first discovered the first site I could find. And there is a total of 12 sites around Abilene, but it took forever to touch those sites one by one. The unknown history was very compelling because all those questions I had could not be answered. And I had to ask people, had to interview, and it took literally decades to reach the point where I had the full story of the Atlas ICBM in Abilene, Texas. And I was doing an economic development talk for the city of Lawn. After my presentation, the mayor approached me and asked if I was indeed the guy that was doing this Atlas history stuff. And he asked me very pointedly, why haven't you an ex expressed an interest in acquisition of our site? And that was the open door that allowed me to uh, pursue um, more aggressively investigation of this site and develop a methodology for legal, legal acquisition. This is intended to be the first site nationwide specifically designed for public interpretation and historic preservation. My ultimate dream is for this site to become the first addition to the Texas Forts Trail, which I think would be a very exciting juxtaposition of our frontier heritage to modern military heritage. And after just a few wrong turns, it was time to find and visit the Lawn Atlas Missile Silo and its owner, Larry Sanders. Hi, Larry. Welcome, welcome. Larry Sanders. Nice to meet you, sir, Bob Malden. And, you know, we, we drove in, and I know a little bit about the history of this place. Hard to believe that giant concrete circle over there would open up and potentially a missile that could fly all the way to Russia? Absolutely. The Atlas F, which was a first generation ICBM, could leave its launch facility here, travel nonstop 8,500 miles away, and land within 1,500 yards of its intended target, which wow. is remarkable for early 60s navigation technology. So tell me, why was this all necessary at that time? Keep in mind that this is a deterrent weapon. And uh, of course you could say, what is the ultimate failure of a deterrent weapon? It's use. Yes. And the fact uh, that we never had to utilize an Atlas ICBM or any ICBM in a defensive mode or any active mode is a manifestation of the value of deterrence. And that's a phenomenal lesson for our young people as well. Deterrence is a very, very important tool for America's defense. We're going to start our tour with the telescoping antenna pit. And when this <laughs> telescoping antenna pit. We're 
We're in Lawn, Texas with historian Larry Sanders to learn more about the Atlas Missile Program and more specifically the missile silo at Lawn. Today a few structures remain above the ground with only hints at what lies below. There's lost history in and under this field in Texas and we're going to find it. Are we able at some point to go actually down underground? Oh absolutely and that I, I wouldn't have you out here with any other ambition but to have Good. you enter we, the launch control center. We were hoping so. that was part of this. So uh, <laughs> show me around. I'd love to see what's out sure, here. Sure, let's take a look. We're going to start our tour with the telescoping antenna pit. <laughs> and when this <laughs> telescoping antenna pit, when this site was operational, communications was incredibly important. So okay. there's a hard line of shielded cable that went directly from this site to Dias Air Force Base. But there was also a low frequency communication system, a 180-foot uh, Christmas tree antenna, which was a high-frequency communication, and that was anticipated to be destroyed in the case of a nuclear attack. So to replace the high-frequency communication, they also had a telescoping antenna pit that was hardened to survive a first nuclear strike. And when this was needed, there would be a open door here that was opened with the high pressure uh, compressed nitrogen that would fly open and then a telescoping antenna would emerge up to 180 feet and that would allow the team in the launch control center to maintain communications with Dias Air Force Base and other bases including uh, SAC headquarters. Some of these uh, ideas from some of my favorite sci-fi movies were actually real. <laughs> Absolutely. That's amazing. So an antenna would just pop up out of here and replace, wow. This is one of my favorite restorations on the site, and this is the emergency escape hatch. Now, obviously, if you had a crew of five underground during a nuclear attack, they had no desire to be buried alive sure. by uh, all the devastation on the surface. Fair. So this is a, a means to guarantee a safe escape. And this is a tube that goes down to the launch control center filled with four tons of sand tacked as a shock absorber and a heat absorber. And then from the launch control center, we'll look at the other end of this emergency escape system and show you exactly how that worked. So I guess like a little ladder coming up from there or something? Yes, oh. exactly. And you can see all of that from, awesome. from below it. Bobby, I'll have to excuse my prejudice but from an engineering point of view, I think this is the most exciting feature of this entire Atlas site. And although this massive slab of concrete may look unimpressive, it's the end point of a device referred to as the site tube. And underneath this metal plate is a 10 inch pipe that is 180 feet long that descends at an exact 49 degree angle to the silo, at the end of which was a device called a collimator that would look optically through this 180 foot, 10 inch pipe and sight in on Polaris and program the missile's inertial navigation system. Now, the reason this impresses me so much, you know, this is late 50s technology and imagine burying a 180 foot, 10 inch pipe in the ground with such precision that at the end, you could look through that pipe and see a speck at the end of it, and that speck would be the North Star. That's remarkable construction capability, and the Corps of Engineers and Black and & Veatch and all those individuals that were a part of that engineering miracle consistently performed this task at all the Atlas sites nationwide. And if there's any compromise in the location of that 180-foot, 10-inch pipe, it would have compromised the entire mission. We're going to come over here to the silo cap and what I love to brag about to people who have never visited this site before as we waltz across this concrete disc we're walking on the roof of a 18 and a half story skyscraper that just happens to be buried in the ground and that's why they're so unappreciated and undertold historically there are two 70 ton doors that were moved by massive hydraulic rams and these rams were so powerful that they could open these doors in between 15 and 18 seconds which is crazy to think about moving that much weight in that short of time
visiting the Atlas Missile Silo near Lawn, Texas. This massive structure was 18 stories entirely underground, only one floor shy of the tallest building in nearby Abilene. We've explored what little is visible from the surface, but now it's time to venture below. We're gonna walk over to the entry portal now and go down to the launch control center. And this is really where all the action took place. Whoa. <laughs> so, entry portal to the launch control. Again, I feel like I'm walking into a sci-fi movie here. <laughs> well, this is an impressive stairway, and it's absolutely crucial to the integrity of the launch control center as well. Because of the design, of these right angle turns. Now I mentioned that we're going to navigate four right angle turns as we enter the launch control center. And those right angle turns were very important to protect the team in the launch control center. First of all, four right angle turns makes the launch control center totally insulated from radiation since radiation can only travel in straight lines. I didn't know that. Secondly, Every time there's a right angle turn, there's a dramatic reduction in the overpressure exerted by a thermonuclear explosion. So even before we get to the first of our two one-ton manganese steel blast doors, we've got three right angle turns, and then there's a fourth right angle turn before we encounter our second blast door. <laughs> wow, and you said blast door, so this is yes. massive here. Yes, they're one-ton manganese steel doors. And they were designed when the site was operational in such a way that you could only have one door open at a time. So never could you compromise the safety of the team located in the launch control center. Wow. This is level one of the launch control center. And level one of this two-story structure is referred to as the ready room because level one is where the crew had their bunk beds, they had a full kitchen, showers, bathrooms, all the luxuries of a missile base. <laughs> so, and this is where the crew of five spent the majority of their 24-hour shift. And what? I don't recall okay. what this was up there. This is a part of the engineering wisdom of this entire site. Originally, the launch control center was designed to be a sphere, and there's obvious characteristics of a sphere that makes it more uh, invulnerable to thermonuclear explosions. However, there's so much space wasted in a sphere that uh, the engineering consulting firm Black & Veatch came up with this idea, a conical uh, top and a conical base of a support column with a flat circular roof that minimizes the exposure to the upward uh, force of a thermonuclear explosion. And because of this conical fan support, this flat roofed, flat floored structure has essentially the same integrity as a sphere. So it's very, very, very safe in terms of uh, protecting the crew from a thermonuclear blast. You'll recall just moments ago when we were on the surface, we were looking at the top side of the emergency escape hatch. And this is the bottom end. To survive a first strike, with the inevitable deterioration of a surface, you would also have the elimination of your conventional entryway, and you'd have to have some way to get out of here. So that's what this offered the crew. And it did that by being filled with four tons of masonry sand, Wow. And then this massive steel door would be closed, sealing it tight. And that sand acts as a heat absorber and also a shock absorber for a thermonuclear explosion. When you were ready to get out through the emergency escape hatch, you'd walk over to this conveniently located out from under the site there, yeah. pull the release, that door would swing open, four tons of masonry sand would drop on the floor and spread out just like sand in an hourglass. And then you would attach your extension ladder and then crawl out of the site. Echoes, dripping sounds. You are extremely alone on your boat in the silo. We are 
underground at the Atlas Missile Silo near Lawn, Texas. We've seen various features on top and had a chance to view both sides of an escape hatch meant to help crew escape in the event of a nuclear blast. But as we venture lower, we're looking for the control room and eventually the silo structure itself, which descends some 18 stories beneath the surface. Okay, welcome to the Launch Control Center. This is the location for the launch console, the power generation panels, all the electronics, navigation equipment, communications equipment, everything that was a vital function for the operation of the weapon itself. The one distinct characteristic of the Launch Control Center Level 2, this steel structure insulated all the delicate electronics that were located here from a first strike electromagnetic pulse attack. EMP can fry any type of electronic and this weapon system would have been rendered totally incapable of operation if it didn't have this structure wrapped around it to protect it from a first strike. And uh, again, historically, that really adds credibility to the Strategic Air Command's logo and their motto, peace is our profession. And a lot of people question that because they question, how could this terrifyingly powerful Air Force proclaim peace as their profession? Well, deterrence was the primary reason for SAC's existence. And uh, this is the heart of that deterrent capability, as well as the ICBM that lived in the silo. Now this first massive steel door is called the debris door. Okay. And it was an afterthought by the engineers who built this site, because I realized if an atlas blew up in the silo, it would fire the blast doors down this tunnel, just like bullets in a rifle toward the crew. Yeah. So this was added to prevent any debris from potentially killing or, or injuring the crew at their stations in the launch control center. Now that's a solid uh, door there, but I'm impressed by how thick this is. Oh, and it's, and it's one and a half inch to two inch plate steel, incredibly heavy. And keep in mind, this was an engineering afterthought. So after the cranes went away, this had to be positioned by hands, by crowbars, and by very, very skilled welders who had to manipulate steel that is unimaginably heavy. So I still don't know exactly how they managed to accomplish that, but they did that to perfection to the point where this door, which is a stack of welded I-beams, is still perfectly balanced wow. and opens and closed with absolutely no effort. And welcome to the silo. This is something wow. very, very few people see on a regular basis. And you've got a you got a boat in here. Absolutely, the water is literally coming up um, so rapidly that it's going to have to be managed before it takes over the entire site. So it's still very magnificent in spite of the fact that the uh, the interior structure is gone. One of the loneliest feelings I've ever experienced is to be in my boat adrift, floating the silo surface. Echoes, dripping sounds, it's a tremendous escape. And uh, again, you are extremely alone whenever you're meditating or just hanging out on your boat in the silo. Very few, if any, will ever know the feeling of drifting alone in the water hundreds of feet below the Earth's surface. Call it one of the perks of owning such a remarkable piece of lost Texas history. But if Larry has his way, someday the Atlas Missile Silo at Lawn, Texas will be one of the only locations associated with this era of military history that you can actually visit and learn about this period, and the weapons we thankfully never had to use. Down the road, or maybe underground, there's another lost legend waiting to be discovered, and on Expedition Texas, we're going to find it. <laughs>